Our first lecturer this afternoon is Dr. Guido Holzman. Guido is a professor of economics at the University of Angers in France. He's the author of Mises, The Last Night of Liberalism, which I encourage you definitely to take a look at. Um, and he's also a member of the senior faculty of the Ludwig von Mises Institute. His lecture this afternoon is on the division of labor and the social order. Guido? Thank you, Mark. I was a little bit deceived by this introduction. You said that all the fun part is over. Now it starts, right? And, and then people shouldn't just look at my book. They should buy multiple copies. <laughs> At least one for each hand, and then also don't be don't be uh, niggardly. Also think of your, your your aunts and uncles who you haven't seen in a long while, and everybody else who merits a copy. So our subject uh, is the division of labor uh, and social order, and what we I will walk you through is um, a basic theory of the division of labor, uh, which is an important element in the theory of wealth creation. And uh, we will, uh, in particular, underline that uh, the division of labor is to a large extent dependent on the volume of savings and what economists call the roundabout, roundabout production. So our lecture is a little bit at, at uh, halfway in between um, uh, basic economic uh, theory, which uh, does not yet pertain to the market economy per se, and uh, the theory of the market economy in which uh, capital accumulation plays a very big role. I will first uh, start off with a couple of definitions, some fundamental terms, and then uh, uh, we'll go through uh, the, the discussion of the division of labor per se, and then the dependence of the division of labor on savings. So our definitions, first one is uh, the division of uh, production. Uh, production is the conscious transformation of, uh, of nature, and the division of labor concerns, of course, uh, production in that sense. So in production, we have always the phenomenon of choice. And it's, it's not something that is uh, occurring automatically, or to the extent that it's occurring automatically, it's not something that we would call uh, production. Uh, you can, of course, put a, a, a few thousand nice bottles of wine into your cave, and I recommend it must be a very good cave. I mean, so you, not everybody should try to do this, because most caves are actually not suitable for wine storing. But <laughs> Uh, so if you do this, you have a nice cave and so on, you, you can do this, so the bottles are then, then you're producing wine that is no longer just two years old or four years old, but 10 years old or 15 years old or 20 years old. And if it's well done, the, the product is really excellent. So you see, I'm, I'm biased in my examples coming from France. And one of the reasons I went to France, of course, because I have good wine. And so in that sense, then, this uh, keeping wine in the cave is a production process because uh, somebody must have put the wine into the cave, and it's up to your choice to take the wine out of the cave or not, or leave it there. And so it's a conscious transformation of nature. The wine is being transformed into a, a type of better quality of wine. Now, labor is a, a production through human action, uh, we shouldn't confuse labor in that sense, it's a very general sense, from labor in uh, the more colloquial sense in which it is often used, namely in the, um, in the sense of paid assistance. And we are talking often in economic texts, well, they are laborers and capitalists. Then we mean by laborers, we mean employed people. Right? And that goes from the PhD, who is the CEO of the company, to uh, the guy or the girl who is working on the uh, production chain somewhere. Right, so uh, labor in that sense, paid assistance, is a more limited phenomenon. What we have here in mind is uh, the, the larger sense, labor being right, you, uh, put in the sense of production through human action. So for example, we can imagine a society in which there are no employees at all, in which everybody is his own entrepreneur. And in that uh, society, there would be labor in that sense, but not labor in the more narrow sense of paid assistance. Production always involves some labor. Right? There can be no uh, production without, simply because somebody needs to make the, the choices. Right? Somebody needs to stock uh, the, the wine in the cellar and, and keep it there. Now, the division of labor occurs when several persons associate in such a way that each of them specializes in one type of activity. Each associate then produces economic goods in excess of his personal needs. 
in order to share or exchange his surplus with the other associates. So I promise I, there won't be uh, any slides of, of, of this sort unless when it comes to definitions, or in case of definition, I will just read my definitions. I won't say it in other words. Right? So it's just for you to see. Uh, the division of labor uh, can be organized according to different uh, principles. And that's, of course, a big subject of economics. Uh, most notably, it can be organized according to a common plan. Right? It's a centrally planned economy, like a socialist economy. Uh, and uh, it can also, and that is the case that is of most interest to us in this week, it can also result from the mutual adjustment of individual plans, which is, of course, characteristic for the market economy. In the market economy, there is no central plan, but different uh, uh, firms and, and households and so on interacting. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's no plan, right? There's, there's rather uh, competing planning, competitive planning. And uh, the plans are not unrelated, but they are related through the mutual adjustment. And this process of mutual adjustment is, uh, is, is complicated, multifaceted. But what, what for us is important is the role of market prices in steering and coordinating and orienting this mutual adjustment of plans. So this is not a subject that we will uh, go into in, in, this, in this lecture. So here we're dealing more with more fundamental issues. And so this is something that we, you will deal with in other lectures. Now our plan here is, as I've announced, first to go through the benefits of the division of labor then turn to the relation between savings and the division of labor, and then uh, highlight some ways uh, in which the, the problem of coordination uh, can be solved. That is, the, the mutual adjustment of, of individual activities can be brought about. In the case of the benefits of the division of labor, it's most convenient to illustrate this with a, a numerical example. So this is what I will do, and we will distinguish most notably uh, three uh, cases. Uh, according to standard procedure by economists. So economists distinguish the case in which um, the different associates have what is called absolute advantages. That is, in which one is the absolutely better specialist as compared to the other guys. The second case is the case of comparative advantage. And in that case, you have uh, some market participants or some members of society who are absolutely better in all fields of activity. Uh, such as myself and uh, my wife. <laughs> she wouldn't agree, therefore I say this. Uh, right? and, uh, adults and children typically, right? at least very small children, typically they, you, you're better as an adult in everything, right? and so on. Uh, healthy people, handicapped people often, right? Yeah, so there's a clear superiority in all fields and so on. Right? So that you have here, but then still we can show that there are benefits of the, in the division of labor between unequal uh, partners. And finally, the case in which the, we have uh, perfectly equal market participants, so the clone economy, if you wish. And so the point for us will be to, to see that, well, first of all, there are material benefits for all uh, members of society cooperating in this way. And secondly, that these benefits indeed derive from the fact that they are unequal, that they are different. Okay, first uh, uh, example, our first case is the case of absolute advantages. So if here uh, two members of society, Peter and Paul, they are cooperating and to make things simple, so I suppose that we have a very primitive economy uh, in which uh, there are only two products that are of interest to uh, both Peter and Paul, uh, namely rabbits and plums. So we have here uh, the, uh, the R, right? R is, is, is rabbit, right? So you see, Peter has a physical productivity of two rabbits per hour. That is, he can, he can uh, grab two rabbits per hour. Somebody always asks me, so what does he do with them? Does he kill them or something? Yeah. He, he has them in his hands. And then <laughs> so maybe he's petting them or something. <laughs> I, and Peter probably has a big family or something like this. And so some rabbits are there for petting and others are there for other things. <laughs> right? And uh, he has a productivity of 500 plums per hour, so he can pluck 500 plums per hour. In the case of Paul, so we see his physical productivity is different. He is uh, not as good a hunter as Peter. He can only uh, grab one rabbit per hour, but he is better in 
plum picking, so he has 1,000 plums per hour. Now, if we suppose that uh, each of them divides his working day, so now this is kind of a, a Japanese working day, right? It's not as in the US or in Germany, where we work seven hours a day or six, and France, it's four and a half. <laughs> As, as a 10 hour working day, it's not China either, as 15 or something. A <laughs> uh, uh, 10 hour working day, so each of them divides his working day in two times five hours five hours rabbit uh, hunting, five hours uh, plum picking. And uh, so Peter, in those five hours, uh, uh, grabs three rab uh, five rabbits, so, uh, excuse me, 10 rabbits. And in another five hours, he picks. 2,500 plums. And for Paul, in the same time, it would then be five rabbits and 5,000 plums. So we get the aggregate product of this uh, little community that is so far, it's not really a community, it's just two individuals working one next to the other, just pursuing peacefully their, their activities and not slapping them in each other's head, which is already something. And sometimes it's, it's, it's a lot, right? If people just don't wage war at one another, we can be happy about this, already not bad. So under such peaceful conditions, but of mutual indifference and so on, uh, they have an aggregate product of 15 rabbits and uh, 7,500 plums. Now, Peter and Paul, for whichever reason, might consider that they might simply share in a division of labor. Right? Maybe they're not completely indifferent to one another, but Peter looks at Paul and says, wow, this guy has very fast hands, so he's kind of slow, so he doesn't catch many rabbits, only the, the lame rabbits and so on, right? <laughs> but he has many plums, and wow, whereas I'm much faster, but I've kind of the, the, uh, the big hands and so on, so I do, don't move very fast, so maybe we should just do it together, uh, adjust our plans. So they talk and they strike a deal and say, look, uh, why don't you specialize in plum picking and I specialize in, in rabbit hunting? And so they come up with this scheme, right? So uh, Peter's physical productivity is unchanged, but he now specializes entirely in the production of rabbits. So the production increases from 10 to 20 simply because he spends more time on rabbit hunting. And as a consequence, because he spends all of his time on rabbit hunting, of course, there's no uh, plum that he picks. And for Paul, it's the other way around. So... The, the overall result then is that uh, the aggregate result is an increase of total production. Right? Total rabbit production increases from 15 to 20, total plum production from 7,000 to uh, 10,000. Now what that means is, of course here we don't talk about the way how they divide the additional, the surplus among them. Right? They are free to do this, it just depends on their negotiation skills or whatever, or, or the altruism, right? Peter, he doesn't ah, give me one extra rabbit and whatever, 10 extra plums, you can have the rest. Maybe uh, they're completely free, or they share equally, right? They're kind of egalitarian. Yeah, each one needs to have the same thing and so on. Uh, they're free to do this. For us, the important point is the overall product has increased. Right? So it is possible to benefit each of them materially as compared to the situation in which they do not cooperate. So there are material incentives to cooperate. That's a, a crucial thing. Right? So even doesn't mean, of course, that in practice they will cooperate. Right? For example, they might still hate one another. Ah, this guy is smelly or whatever, or he's a, he's a German or whatever. And they say, ah, we don't want to do this. Right? So there are still other reasons that might prevent this cooperation. But what we here see is that there is a material incentive to do this. So this gives us then the key to understand why people would uh, look for cooperation in the first place. Now, you see here that I, I put uh, division of labor one. So this is the result of the division of labor, the, the immediate impact. That is, the impact without taking in, in, into consideration that the division of labor itself will transform the two specialists. As a consequence of specializing in rabbit hunting, Peter will become a more efficient hunter as a consequence of specializing in uh, plum picking, Paul will become an even better plum picker. And of course, each of them will lose somewhat in his ability of producing the other good. Right? So you have these learning effects right, that, that result from specialization. And here we have their, their uh, so to say, their initial inborn, natural uh, in, in, uh, difference or in, uh, talents and so on. And as a consequence of the division of labor, they acquire 
uh, certain capacities or lose certain capacities that they would otherwise have had. So let's look at this. Right? Peter becomes a better hunter, so his productivity increases from two to three rabbits per hour, and his productivity as a plum picker decreases from 500 to 400. And for Paul, it's the other way around. So as a consequence, then, of these learning effects, right, the benefits derived from the division of labor increase even further. Right? So it's a numerical example. Right? And that is, of course, what we observe, as we can easily uh, understand, right, what would happen in any case, any two goods, any two individuals in which we have these initial conditions, namely that there is inequality in productivity, uh, we get a similar result. Okay, so let us turn then to the second case, uh, the case of comparative advantage. In the case of comparative advantage, we have, as we have said, one superior being the man and one inferior being the woman. Here it's Peter and Paul. So Paul is the superman and, and Peter is the less, lesser human being. <laughs> So we see that uh, uh, Paul can do everything better than, than Peter. Uh, and the, at first, they don't cooperate, and they pro pro produce a total of uh, 30. Why do I have L here? This is strange. Oh, this is because I translated my French slide. L, L stands for lapin. This is, is, is rabbit. Right? It's the same thing. Right? Just, just substitute L for. Yeah. Okay, I won't make any further jokes on this. Uh, right, so in, for a very long time, uh, people who thought about social organization thought that under uh, such conditions, there would be no incentive for uh, the superman, for Paul, to engage in any kind of trade with Peter. What could Paul possibly gain by cooperating with Peter? He can do everything better. So if ever he provides certain services uh, to Peter, it's not because he expects anything in return, but and it's just out of pure charity and, and goodwill, and uh, he's a nice human being. But then, of course, he, he might expect something in return in the form of obedience. And right? so we had here the, the, the classical, uh, classical justification of uh, social hierarchy. Right? There's one guy who determines how the show is going on. The other guys ob obey, because if you don't obey, I'll use the big stick to, to hit you on the, on the head or, or elsewhere. Um, things changed then when David Ricardo, a classical economist, discovered the principle of, the, of comparative advantages. And what com Ricardo discovered was that, in fact, even in such a case, a division of labor is possible that benefits both partners, the superior or the, the inferior and the superior. So this is what we see here. The, the trick is, as compared to the previous uh, arrangement of absolute advantages, is that Paul, the superior producer, he cannot become a pure specialist. So he needs to divide his time differently, but right, not, no longer five and five, but uh, in different ways. So here you see um, that Paul spends uh, three hours on uh, hunting, right? Yes, and he spends seven hours on picking. Plums, right? So, and as a consequence, so his productivity is four rabbits per hour, so he produces in three hours 12 rabbits, and with 2,000 plums per hour, he uh, produces in seven hours 14,000 plums. So, the result is again an, an increase of the overall product, right? There are both more rabbits and more plums available in this society. So, we understand here that. The material benefits that push people to cooperate do not only exist in the case of absolute advantages, but also, especially in the, in the uh, empirically very frequent case of uh, comparative advantages. So there's always a way to figure out a division of labor that is beneficial, material beneficial, for all parties involved. This holds both true on the individual level, but it also, also, also holds true if we consider groups, collectives, and so on, such as nations. Right, for example. And so 
Uh, in the 1980s, there were lots of concerns in, in Europe. Yeah, the Japanese are taking everybody over. They will put, outproduce every one of us. We, nobody can stand up to the productivity of the Japanese. We'll all be drowned in Japanese products and will disappear from the face of the earth. Right? So what this theory shows is this is all baloney. Right? The Japanese can become as productive as they, as they wish. They always have an incentive to share the division of labor with less productive uh, nations. Right? The difficulty in practice is always to find the arrangement, right, the, the division of labor that is beneficial for all parties involved. But there always is such an uh, arrangement, such a division of labor. In the market economy, this problem is solved through the process of market pricing. Uh, in the country, uh, countries that are very uh, uh, productive and so on, there's a lot of capital typically, something that we'll talk about later. Right? Uh, typically, they have, uh, uh, they have a higher profitability uh, than in, in those trades, but in other countries, there will be some trades will be profitable still and more profitable than in uh, the countries that are, from the overall point of view, more productive. Okay, and here we have, of course, the same uh, uh, learning effects that we discussed already before. As the consequence of specialization, PETA will become a more efficient um, hunter. And uh, uh, Paul, in the case of Paul, right, you'll see here too, right, there will be such an effect. His productivity in hunting will decrease from four to three, and in rabbit uh, plum picking from 2000 to 2500 will be an increase. Right. Okay, finally, we might uh, consider the case in which there are no inequalities, no differences, uh, whatever, but in which we have perfect clones. And the, the purpose of this consideration is only to highlight the fact that, indeed, the, the benefits that derive from the division of labor, in which we see here, derive from, the, uh, from inequality, from differences. So if we consider the case of natural equality, but in the case of artificial equality, like cloning, for example, the same result would hold, right, we get no benefits, no immediate benefits in the division of labor. Right? Peter and Paul, you see their exact clones in, as far as productivity is concerned, um, and so if they divide labor amongst them, uh, there will be no improvement as compared to the, the situation without a division of labor, right? Rabbit production stays at 20 and plant production stays at uh, 5,000. Now, things change even in that economy only to the extent that due to the specialization, if they engage in whatever specialization, they become different. Right? Paul specializing in rabbit hunting becomes a better hunter. Paul specializing in rabbit plucking becomes a better plucker. Rabbit plucker. Uh, when this is, uh, yeah, yeah, right, it increases from 500 to 700, right? So, but then they're no longer clones, right? They're no longer equal, right? They have become different. Right? They have, uh, there's an acquired uh, inequality that results from specialization, that results from the division of labor. And to that extent, then, and it, we observe, again, that there are overall benefits, and therefore also individual benefits, resulting from the division of labor. Okay, let us uh, summarize, then, these, these findings. The first conclusion that we can draw from, from this analysis is that the division of labor entails material advantages for all associates. And this advantage results from the exploitation of the differences in physical productivity through specialization. And as we've seen, the specialization reinforces natural differences. That is, rather natural, it would probably be better to speak of initial right, differences, because it's not unnatural that you have an acquired difference. Right? So it reinforces initial differences and creates man-made cultural differences in physical productivity. Third, by understanding these material advantages, we can explain the formation of human societies. Ludwig von Mises called this the law of association. The law of association tells us that, that human beings, under all circumstances, have a material uh, incentive to cooperate, to form societies, not to remain 
isolated as individuals, but to look for the cooperation with other human beings. There's always material advantage, material incentive to derive from this. Again, doesn't mean that they will do it. Right? There might be other considerations that come into play. You have a hermit or something like this, or a monk, and you just know he doesn't want to be with the other guys. He wants to keep to himself and just think of God and look at the birds and so on. Right? But still, so he foregoes, it comes at a cost, right? He stays for himself, but he foregoes these benefits that he could otherwise have derived. Now, Mises coined the phrase law of association, and he did so in his book Socialism, which was published first in 1922. But Mises was not the first to discover this principle, that the origin of society resides in the material advantages that society provides. Uh, and the first source uh, that we find in which this, this uh, fact is highlighted is, in fact, in, in Plato. And if, uh, those of you who study philosophy uh, might know the text. Who is studying? Where are the philosophy students here? Yeah, so which text is it? Very good. As the Republic, the opening chapters of the Republic. And so Plato wants to devise the, uh, the ruling principles of a just society. And so in order to identify them, he first analyzes how would society operate without any consideration of justice, right? So natural, spontaneous emergence of society. Uh, so th that's what he does first. And so he highlights these facts. Well, people gather together and they cooperate because they derive material incentives from it. And that idea has then remained throughout Western philosophy well, for the next uh, 2,500 years. Right? It was known by the medieval scholastics. Thomas Aquinas uh, highlighted this fact. Right? The origin of society is in the material advantages that it procures to all associates, etc., etc. And then goes to the classical economists, and uh, Mises uh, highlights this again. Mises to this extent here, it contributes only the, the expression. It's a law of association. The second uh, conclusion is that the division of labor, as we have seen, is beneficial only to the extent that the associates are different. And it follows, therefore, that egalitarian policies are antisocial. Now, by egalitarian policies, I mean uh, government interventions, uh, measures uh, involving the violation of property rights, with the objective of making people more equal or less different. And to the extent that we turn the whole society into a whole bunch of clones or something like this, we destroy society. There's no more incentive to cooperate. And the only binding thing then that would remain is just love for other human beings. I don't say that that's not important. I think it's very important. But uh, empirically, I mean, we see uh, right now, right, uh, even if we have very strong incentives, material incentives to cooperate because we're not clones, right, people are still waging war all the time. So you imagine how it would be in a society where they're just clones, right? I mean, it would, of course, be much more. Very few people love their, their neighbor enough to keep peaceful right, if there are no material advantages to be derived from this. The second point is that... Uh, Natural differences are a useful starting point for the division of labor and the building of society. And so rather than trying at, at all price to eradicate differences, uh, it, it is useful, and this is actually what human beings have, have done throughout the ages uh, with great success, is to build on your strengths. Right? It doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to eradicate your weaknesses, right? but, it, and, but your contribution to society is always built on your, your relative strength. And of course, we can spend our time trying to uh, cut the heads of people who are a little higher than us in, in certain respects to, to make everybody equal, or we can try to uh, work and develop our own strengths, uh, uh, which result from uh, our natural uh, endowments, right? As, as females, males, uh, uh, older people, younger people, right? Different individuals have different natural position that gives them both weaknesses and strengths. So the point is to identify the, the strengths and make a contribution with this uh, to uh, social cooperation. So this is the starting uh, point. We've already uh, covered important ground. We will now highlight the fact that the division of labor depends to a very large extent on uh, the availability of capital and the availability of savings. Without savings, the division of labor wouldn't go very far. It would, by and large, concern the cooperation with, between hunters and gatherers. 
right? So people were producing rabbits and, and plums and so on, maybe a little uh, uh, cloth making or even cloth making might already be difficult. Right? There's no place for accountants there, no place for economists, no place for fashion designers, no place for taxi drivers, etc., etc., etc. As a very primitive society, which have very few opportunities for the division of labor, very few opportunities for each of us to bring to, to fruition his or her particular uh, abilities and talents. So we have to analyze this process that makes that the division of labor increases, and this is dependent on savings. So we'll start again with a few definitions, which should be familiar to the economists. Savings are that part of a person's revenue which he or she does not presently consume. Right, so we have this arithmetic uh, equality, it's just a tautology that uh, is uh, equality between revenue and the product, uh, so the addition of uh, uh, <laughs> consumption and, and savings. Right? We have revenue, and by revenue, economists mean um, uh, the, the final usable goods that accrue to us in any given period, right? so typically consumer goods. Uh, that we obtain in a given a period. Uh, the Austrian uh, economists like to talk about present goods, right? goods that are presently, can be presently used in final use, uh, in particular consumer goods, but also money. Right? So this is our revenue, and our revenue we can either uh, consume, right? if our revenue is just real, as this, we, we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a natural, in a barter economy and so on, we have rabbits and... Um, uh, and plums as revenue, then we can eat the rabbits and the plums. Uh, so this would be consumption, or we can save them, that is, we put them aside and have them uh, again the next day, and so on. But there are no other uses. Either we use them now, or we do, or we do not. And there are just these two possibilities. So it's a, a tautological uh, equation. In a monetary economy, we do the same thing with money, right? We have monetary revenue, and the money that we earn can be uh, spend on consumer goods or not spend on consumer goods. Exactly these two possibilities. I uh, know there's no third possibility. Right? So in all cases, revenue equals consumption plus savings. As a, in parenthesis, right, savings can be made in the context of a person's household or a, a person's firm. And most savings that are being made today are actually made within the firms, not uh, with, uh, within household revenue. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have a revenue, yearly re annual revenue of one hundred thousand uh, dollars. Right? Uh, in the average American households right now, I think they would save around five thousand dollars out of this. Right? So you have a savings rate that's very low out of current revenue, is around five percent. But in fact, the, the households typically have also wealth. And so they have, uh, whatever, the same household might have $1 million of wealth. Now, what is this wealth? Well, it's saved revenue. Either his own saved revenue or saved revenue of his ancestors or friends that he has inherited or that has been given to him. Right? And this revenue typically is invested in, in firms. Right? And then firms, to the extent that they spend this money on producers' goods and so on, well, they are using the savings. They're spend, investing the savings. And each time they gain revenue again and they spend again on, on factors of production, they use savings. So the bulk of all savings does not come out of uh, the revenue of households, but of the revenue of firms uh, in, in a developed market economy. But this is in parenthesis. So what we need to do now is to look at how do savings benefit production? How do savings benefit, therefore, the division of labor? And the key to this is uh, what uh, Austrian economists call the law of roundabout production. What is the law of roundabout, uh, what is roundabout production? Well, um, uh, roundabout production is, is a gradual term, so there's more or less. Uh, production can be more uh, roundabout or less roundabout. You can substitute uh, for the word roundabout, you can substitute the word indirect. Right? So more roundabout production means to reduce the proportion of labor dedicated to the production of final goods, in particular consumer goods, 
and to increase the proportion of labor dedicated to the production of intermediate goods and tools, so-called capital goods. So I can spend all my time on the direct production of consumer goods. In a very primitive economy, as we have seen, right, Peter and Paul, they, they are, we didn't talk about any tools or something like this, right? They were all running after the rabbits and then grabbing them with their hands, or maybe they were digging a little hole or something like this, right? So they spent all, on their, all of their time on the production of consumer goods. There's no production in our, in the economy that we considered before, no production of, of capital goods. Now, Peter and Paul might, of course, increase their productivity by producing, let's say, a gun. Of course, it's out of the question that they could produce in, in a lifetime a gun if you are in a, in a primitive economy. You never get there, get to this point, right? Let's say that, so they, they could do this also, some, some other weapon, right? You know, maybe take a, uh, a branch from, from a tree and then sharpen it at one end, so use it for, for rabbit hunting, or maybe bigger, bigger <laughs> beasts, right? The poor rabbits, uh, right? So, but in that case, if they do this, right, then they subdivide their labor differently. It's no longer 100% invested in the production of consumer goods. A part of it is now dedicated to the production of tools. Right? So he, whatever, P Peter then spends 30% of his time producing hunting tools, or maybe 70% of his time producing hunting tools, and only 30% of his time producing, uh, or hunting, actually hunting. So why might he do this? Well, because 30% of his time spent on hunting, ten, uh, three hours a day spent on hunting with a good hunting weapon, with a good spare or something like this, might be more productive than 10 hours without a spare. Uh, so that's, that's why we do this. So the general law here is that the more round about the production process, the more productive is human labor. Now, there's one word that is missing here that you need to plug in. It's the more physically productive is human labor. And the more physically productive is human labor. The more tools that are at our disposition, right, the higher is the productivity per hour spent on the production of final consumer goods. That's the law of roundabout production. Now, how do savings come into place? Well, savings come into play because uh, during the time that we are engaged in producing capital goods, we do not produce, by definition, we do not produce consumer goods. Right? But we still need to survive the time that we spend on producing a spare or whatever else. Now, this is not a big problem in the case of very primitive tools and so on. We spend a few hours on making a spare. Even there, it's true, but it's, it's not striking. But think, again, think of something that takes many days to make. Like, for example, a net. Now, I'll give you an example of a net uh, in a minute. Right? Then, in order to make that tool, right, we cannot spend any time for several days on producing consumer goods. So how do we feed ourselves during that time? And the answer is we feed ourselves out of accumulated savings. So savings are needed to finance production. And what is being financed is the consumption of human beings. There's nothing else that, from an aggregate point of view, needs to be financed. To finance means to sustain the consumption of the human beings involved in the production of capital goods. So these are the most two important things that you need to know about the theory of capital. We'll have other lectures, probably repeat some of this and go into more detail. I will give you now an example, the classical example of the fisherman, an example that comes to us from 19th century German economist uh, uh, Russia, Wilhelm Russia. And Bimbavec cites Russia on that point. Bimbavec and Menga were both great admirers of, of Russia. He was an excellent pedagogue. So Russia gave the example of a fisherman. Right? The, the fisherman is kind of a cruiser, right? who is uh, stranded on his island, so he has some technological knowledge and so on. He's sitting on, and, uh, on, on this island. There's nobody around to help him. No shop where he can buy groceries and so on. He has to do everything on his own. 
he has no tools, maybe he has some sunk clothes left from uh, surviving the shipwreck and so on. He has two healthy hands, and he is lucky enough to have been stranded on the boards of a uh, uh, river with lots of fish, so he can fish with his bare hands. Now, in order to become more productive, well, this way, so he produces a few fish per day, let's say four fish per day, and he needs, whatever, a fish per day to survive. And so he fishes four fish in 10 hours and eats one of them, and the next three days he can take off. So he lives a hand-to-mouth existence. Right? Just the production is just barely sufficient to, to cover his needs, but, well, he has some leisure, so he's thinking of the good old times and uh, in, in, in desperation thinks about how he might improve his lot, and he thinks about, yeah, I, in, actually to improve my lot, I need to become more productive because all the things that I want to consume, I have to produce myself. But my working day is 10 hours, I can do only so many things in 10 hours, so in order to have higher consumption, in order to benefit from more goods, I need to produce more. It's very simple. So how can I produce more? Well, I need more tools. So he comes to the idea, fortunately, he comes from a civilization, right? So he knows the concept of a net. And he's going on to develop a net. What does he need to do in order to produce uh, the net? Well, so he makes it out of whatever stuff that he finds in the jungle, lianes, uh, and so on. And uh, has never made a net in his life, of course. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a risky product because you know, he's never been a net maker. Makes a plan. Uh, this is an entrepreneurial venture, will my net be sturdy enough, or if, if it's too sturdy, I cannot use it, <laughs> right? Uh, and so on, but it's, right? so he thinks about these things, already just thinking about how he will uh, make the net takes, takes time. Right? So fortunately, he has his savings, right? He has the three fish that he has fished on the first day that he has not yet consumed, so he can take his time consuming, making plants, and so on. And then finally, he sets out to produce a net. In order to produce a net, what does he need? Again, he needs savings because he now dedicates his time to, to the making of the net. So he cannot produce fish at the same time. And so eventually he will have his net and then his productivity will increase. But this is dependent on the availability of savings. Okay, let's, let's walk through a numerical example. So we have the production of consumer, uh, not, not only of consumer goods, of, of all kinds of goods. So we have fish and, and, and berries and nets. And so he produces four fish. And he consumes one fish per day. He doesn't consume any berries because he didn't produce any berries. He could also consume leisure, right? Leisure is, is a great good because um, uh, you don't have to produce it. You just need to have enough in your tummy to, to survive the day, that otherwise it would not be a really nice day of leisure. And he has his savings, so he has uh, saved uh, in terms of fish. He could have saved also in terms of berries, but he, he has only produced fish. So at the end of the second day, he has, produced, he has a savings of six fish. So now he can set out to, uh, to make his net. That's what he does here, right? You see, he produces no consumer goods, no more fish production, no more berry production, but he produces a net. I put here, so this is kind of uh, uh, fiction, right? I mean, a quarter net does not, strictly speaking, exist, right? There's no such thing as a quarter net that you can use 25% or something like this, right? It just means right, the, 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 uh, the production process has progressed by 25% of the time needed to do this, right? So the, the net only exists on the sixth day. And we see, right, so he, he needed to have savings to get to the sixth day because he couldn't dedicate any time to the production of consumer goods. So his savings on the sixth day have been run down from six to, to four fish, right? And he has a net. Now, this uh, process economists call capital accumulation, right? It's this uh, progression of the, the creation of the, of the capital good. It's a process of capital accumulation. And then starting from day seven, he can um, use the, the net to fish fish. And because he has a net, he doesn't need to spend much time. Maybe he spends just, whatever, one or two hours per day on, on fishing. He fishes a lot of fish in one or two hours with a net. Uh, so he can do other things. He can now indulge in, in leisure. He can uh, 
produce other things that were inaccessible to him before, such as uh, berry plucking. Right? And during this process, of course, what, what happens is that the net itself is, of course, not eternal, right? The net itself wears out. Right? So this is the process of capital consumption. So we have an example here, right? So, you know, in whatever, in two hours or so, he fishes 12 fish, and he can use the rest of his time uh, to pluck berries. And during the, these four days, then the net wears out, so we have here the process of capital consumption. Right? He doesn't replace the net with something else. He consumes his capital. Was, he is an overall capital consumption. Right? So, so we see already then, of course, what will happen after, uh, as from day 11, right, is productivity will be back to the initial low level. Right? So in actual practice, things do not usually work that way, right? You build your tool and then you just wear it out and you start from afresh. Usually you benefit from the fact that you, are in this, uh, you have this tool, right, that you dedicate a part of your time to replacing or making another tool or repairing the net and, and so on. And from an aggregate point of view, of course, that's what's going on in the market economy, where right? there's constant rebuilding of capital goods going on at the same time that we, that we also consume them. Right? So the aggregate level of capital available does not necessarily diminish. And usually in a growing economy, it increases. Right? Okay, so, right? so we see that he builds up more savings, and, uh, right? and then... Um, he needs to make up his mind how to go from there. He could, can build another net or can just revert back, have a, a few days of great fiesta, right? As Greek or Spanish economic like uh, behavior, right? So here, this is, this is, a, this is the Greek scenario. This is uh, retirement at uh, age 55 or something, right? So uh, our cruiser, he takes a great time, time out, right? He doesn't produce anything, just consumes his savings. And why not? I mean, there's nothing wrong with this, right? And problems always result from the fact that right, sometimes you do not really want this, and then other people try to <laughs> consume your savings, and it gets really nasty. Uh, so, but here, he, it's his property, right? It's his savings, so why should he not be free to just consume them? And that, that's what he does. And then maybe one day he will consider again building a net, and he goes from there again. Or he will start on a real strong growth path and, and so on, build a lot of capital, right, create a house or a traffic system for himself. Uh, or maybe they're in a boat, right? And you get finally back to civilization. Okay, so then what are the benefits of savings? As we have seen that savings uh, allow for a higher productivity of human growth because they enable us to pursue more roundabout production. Okay. So for that reason alone, therefore, we, we took this example of a cruiser, right? Even if we are talking out of a, outside of a, a social context, savings are beneficial. But savings are incomparably more beneficial still in a society. Because then savings can be used to reinforce the division of labor. Think of it in, in our example. So Crusoe, he was building his net. And he might go, have gone on going from there still, right? He might have, for example, in the next step, he might have become even more roundabout, right? He might have set uh, aside some time to, uh, uh, to make a, a needle, maybe out of a fishbone or something, to facilitate the making of the net, uh, and so on and so on and so on. Yes, you can become ever more roundabout, become ever more productive, finally. Now, and if Cruz is all alone, he has to do this all on himself. So he has to divide his time on these different activities. But if you have a society, you can right, specialize. Some people are the net makers, some people are the needle makers, some people are the, the fishermen, some people are the berry pluckers, and so on and so on. And this is facilitated through the existence of savings. Even if there's just one guy who saves, the capitalist, he might sustain the activities of other people engaged in the production of capital goods, even though those guys, they don't have savings on their own. They just share, thereafter they share his, uh, his product. There is a uh, is, a, is, a, is a great comic book uh, re rendition of this process. Uh, some of you might know this already. It's, uh, the, the author is Irwin Schiff. He's the father, father of uh, Peter Schiff's. Uh, so he describes uh, 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 fish, fish-based capitalism. <laughs> Have a look at it. I, th I think you, you will find it on the internet, right? I think you can just download the, the comic. It's very good 
instruction. So if you have teenage brothers and sisters, or if you enjoy comics yourself, this is, this is a thing to look at, right? So roundabout production is beneficial, and even more beneficial if joined with the uh, division of labor. Right? Only roundabout production allows for a large-scale division of labor. Without savings, there is not much of a division of labor. And that is the reason why some countries today are still very poor, right? Some countries are very primitive economies, some African countries. Why is that? Because there's not much of any savings invested in those places. And as a consequence, people have the choice of specializing in hunting and, and, and gathering and becoming a robber and I, I don't know what, right? because there is not much else to do. There's nothing that would finance those other activities in real terms. Because you, don't just need monetary finance, you need real finance, availability of real, saved consumer goods. And in other economies, uh, well, this problem does not exist because we have a lot of savings as in, in Western Europe and in uh, the United States or North America. Let me mention in passing that, that savings are also uh, important to in facilitating technological progress or technical progress. Think of uh, the example that I've given to you. So Crusoe sits there on his, uh, his island and he just thinks about net making. Just taking the time, being able to take the time to think about making a plan, production plan and so on, consumes time. How does he finance this? Well, he has consumer goods, he has savings. And if he's occupied with fishing fish and so he just needs to watch the fish, there's nothing else to which he can, uh, about which he can think. Right? He needs to be at leisure to do this. Right? So the answer, the short answer to the question is how do we finance research and development is always out of savings. Right? A research and development R&D department in a company is financed out of the savings built up in the company. A company earns revenue and reinvests in R&D. Right? It's part of the savings of the company. Part of the wealth right, that ultimately belongs to households. And then once you set out to put a new technology into practice, well, you typically you, you, so you have a blueprint, but then you need all the machines, all the infrastructure, and so on to put this into, into place. You need, again, savings. Technology per se doesn't get you anywhere. African countries have all the technology they need. Right? They can just download most of the stuff from the Internet or make a short excursion uh, with a $400 flight to, to Western Europe or to the U.S. or somewhere. And just have to look at how things are being handled. It's not technology. The problem is savings. And as a consequence, as a further consequence, then, of course, peace and cooperation tend to be reinforced, right? because then, as a consequence of this large-scale division of labor, everybody becomes more dependent uh, on the support of, of other human beings. Right? Waging war in a society based on the division of labor is very expensive, very high opportunity costs. Uh, not only I lose my revenue, but I mean, the, I destroy things, I destroy uh, whatever, my, my neighbors and, and their capital goods and so on as a consequence. I will be hit myself. Okay, well, we forget about these, these two uh, last two things. I will now switch over to um, talk a little bit about the problem of coordination. So the... the the point here is just to highlight the different methods that can be used to coordinate the division of labor. So what is coordination? Again, right, the, we, we say that persons in the division of labor are coordinated if their cooperation provides satisfactory results for each of them. And that is important for each of them. Now, of course, you can be more or less satisfied Right? Uh, that is, is, that's a gradual thing. But there is no coordination if there are no benefits for each of the person engaged in the division of labor. The problem of coordination, then, is to put a concrete division of labor into practice. Right? So this is the case that we discussed before. Right? We have the supreme Japanese economy. Well, it's, that was the 1980s. Today, it's... We don't know exactly. Right? Uh, three years ago it was China, now China is losing some of the, uh, the appearance of, of an overpower and so on. Right? But so the, the problem was how do we arrange a division of labor between 
uh, different nations or different individuals. Right? That, that's the true problem. We always know that there are benefits to be derived, but we need to find the right arrangement. So how do we do this? <clears throat> we have to answer most notably two questions. The first one is, uh, who should do what? And uh, the more fundamental question is here would be, who decides and how? Who should do what? And the second question is, who obtains how much out of the aggregate product? Again, in a market economy, both questions find a simultaneous answer in the market process. In the market process, uh, in the, market process the decision who should do what remains with each uh, uh, individual. Right? We decide to pursue this or that activity, of course, often under the impact of, well, we get an offer from a company, so we become employees, we insert ourselves in the division of labor as employees, and right? so here then the, the revenue provides the incentive for us to join this company A rather than a company B, or rather, right, for, from a uh, dynamic point of view, I don't look just at the highest payment right now, but I also project myself, right, how will my revenue uh, evolve in the course of time, and is it a pleasant activity, is it something where that, that pleases me uh, emotionally and so on, right? So you might sometimes choose activities that earn us a lower revenue, but that are more satisfactory for us on other grounds, right? So all of this is taken into account, provides the incentives that steer us into this or that, that activity. So in a market economy, every single individual decides uh, what he should do. And who obtains how much out of the aggregate product? Well, this depends on the contractual arrangement. I insert myself as an employee in a company, well, it's decided how much I get out of the revenue. But that's not the only uh, solution uh, to the coordination problem. So if we now make abstraction from our violent solution, right, so the, the Nazi version or the, the, the Bolshevik version and so on, just look at theoretically possible peaceful solutions, then uh, collectivism is indeed one possible solution. Right? There's something like uh, voluntary collectivism, uh, like marriage, for example. Right? And, you, and as we see by, by looking at divorce rates, right, um, collectivism is difficult, <laughs> even if there are just two. Right? It's, it's crazy, right? If you think, you have millions of people or billions of people should be involved in decision making. It's just crazy. And, uh, it's, especially, it's the same persons, typically, right, who are in favor of uh, collectivism of some sort, who have the highest divorce rates. That's <laughs> yeah. one of the mysteries of the human psyche. In practice, uh, how, how do, do we see this? If we, this, okay, marriage, okay, is one thing, but especially producer cooperatives. All right, so here we have coordination through central planning and a centrally agreed upon distribution of revenues. And there is a voluntary submission to the central plan on the side of each uh, member of the cooperative. Now, cooperatives uh, uh, work wherever the, the interests of the collective are fairly homogeneous and where the collective is small. Right? And that's crucial. As, as soon as it becomes big, then the negotiation costs exponentially increase and it becomes unmanageable. Right? So often, uh, th th this can work fairly well, although how well it just works is difficult to tell because in most countries, producer cooperatives are uh, uh, legally privileged uh, by the, the tax code and various other things. Right? Two more minutes, yeah. Uh, the other, uh, the, the, the second type of, second useful solution to the coordination problem is representative central decision-making. And here the... Uh, paradigmatic case would be the one of a guru. So this is the, uh, the Reverend Moon. Here he sees the, the leader of, of the sect of the Moonies. And I came across uh, them uh, many years ago when, when I attended one of their congresses. I was invited. Don't ask me how I came. To, I'm not a Moonie. But I, so they have this scientific congress every year in which they invite people, especially that they do not really belong to the Moonie sect because they want to 
gain in credibility and so on, statue. So I was invited to the zoo. I came to, to see, not to handshake the, the Reverend Moon. And I will spare you <laughs> funny details about the theology and so on. But the, what I found fascinating is so, so one of the things that they do is, um, is to marry each other because one of the central elements of the Muni theology is that marriage has been underappreciated in Christianity. So the important point really is to get people to marry one another and really to marry completely across the board. I mean, you see that the Reverend Moon, he has a, he's Korean, he has also a Korean wife, but, but all others have to marry somebody from a completely different place of the world, right? So if the German marries the Eskimo and the French guy marries the Australian and so it goes all over the, the, the whole thing, right? And so they gary one, uh, gather once a year in, in a stadium or so in, uh, in, in South Korea and then you have the mass wedding. And typically uh, most couples get to meet their, their future spouse <laughs> at that very moment, right? <laughs> But again, there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, why not? It's kind of a marriage lottery or something. And uh, right, so they do this voluntarily. There's no, no coercion involved and so on. They, they do this. Right? And the Reverend Moon, I mean, he's doing this. Uh, how many members does he have in his uh, sector? Uh, a few hundred thousand, I guess. So that's how far we get in the case of some of the most successful guys. Right? But even he is not running all economic decision-making uh, from a central place. And it's completely out of the question that, that this method could be applied from the point of view of the world economy involving a couple of billion peoples. And so the only solution that um, uh, can be applied for very large-scale division of labor is the market economy. And therefore, understanding the market economy is one of the most crucial things that we can learn in economics. Right? can spend a lot of time on uh, understanding central planning, planning techniques, and so on. It's, it's basically a waste of time if you haven't understood how the market economy works without a central plan. Right? So in a market economy, we have private property of uh, all factors of production and decentralized planning based on economic calculation and different entrepreneurial visions of uh, the future. And we have a spontaneous coordination that is mutual adjustment of individual plans through competitive contracting. And that is called the market process. Right? And the revenues, as, have, as we've seen, result from contracts and not from centrally arranged uh, di distribution of the boot or something like this. Okay. So in the next lectures, right, so we'll go into more detail analyzing the market economy, right? first looking at, at money and then uh, more detail at capital theory and finally at competition monopoly and things like this. Okay. I was very careful not to leave any time for questions, so you cannot embarrass me. <laughs>